Hello, and welcome to this presentation on special relativity. The story of relativity is interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, because it illustrates how science works, or at least how it's supposed to work. And then you can also get a deep understanding of what it means without any mathematics at all. And if you decide to pursue the math, you'll find that there's nothing that can't be understood by a grade 9 student. The math is easy, but the concepts are quite hard. And then, of course, the results are so incredibly mind-bending and universe-changing. So at the, end of the at, at the beginning of the 20th century, at the end of the 1800s, physics had made great strides. Everything was nice and tidily explained. Physicists thought that all the important laws had already been discovered and that there was nothing more to be done except for cleaning up minor problems and improving method and measurement. There were just two tiny insignificant problems still outstanding, but scientists were sure that small modifications to existing theories would take care of them. There was a problem in the understanding of how heat radiates from a hot black body. And then there was a tiny peculiarity in the way that light was predicted to behave. In the next 15 years, those two problems had entirely blown up our understanding of the universe. We realized that we knew almost nothing. Far from being near the end of physics, we realized that we were not even at the beginning, and not even at the beginning of understanding of how the universe actually functions. The first problem led to the formulation of quantum mechanics, and the second one led to the development of the theories of relativity. We are only going to deal with the second problem in this talk, the little problem of the speed of light. In this lecture we are going to explore the origins of Einstein's theory and how his mind worked. There is no mathematics needed, although we do use a tiny bit for illustrative purposes. So what is it that we mean by relativity? What we mean is that we can only measure speed relative to something else. So when we say we're traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, we mean 100 kilometers per hour relative to the surface of the Earth. Of course, the Earth itself is spinning at about 2,000 kilometers per hour, and at the same time zooming around the Sun. And the Sun itself is traveling around the galaxy, and the galaxy is moving relative to other galaxies. The Golden Great Gate Bridge in San Francisco and the Kremlin in Moscow are not moving relative to the Earth, of course, but because they are on opposite sides of the Earth, they are moving at hundreds of miles per hour relative to each other. If two sh spaceships pass each other, it's impossible to decide which spaceship is still and which one is moving. All we know is that they are moving relative to each other. We kind of accept this as a given, that there's no such thing as absolute velocity, and there's only relative velocity. This principle was first formulated by Galileo in the 16th century. This is the famous Galileo who postulated that the Earth moved around the Sun, and was excommunicated for his trouble. Under a Galilean transformation, which simply involves changing an experiment to another location, moving at a different speed. Nothing in the two experiments can show which of these locations is moving and which is not moving, as long as the motions are uniform and not accelerating. Incidentally, a device that makes use of relativity is a wind tunnel. What we're trying to model is a wind moving through still air, but it's much easier to measure forces if the wing is still and the air is moving. So that's what we do, and we expect to get the same answers, and we do. So relativity is a very old concept, and has been part of our view of the universe for quite a long time. We're going to be talking a lot about the speed of light. What is the speed of light? It's pretty speedy. The speed of light is always designated as C, so you'll see the letter C appearing in, in a lot of the, what we talk about. The speed of light is 300,000 watt feet, meters, kilometers, kilometers per what? Per day? Per hour? It would be pretty speedy if it was 300,000 kilometers per hour. 
was actually 300,000 kilometers per second. That's very fast indeed. The fastest space probes that we have travel less than one ten thousandth of the speed of light. And yet the speed of light is also very slow. It takes years for light to travel from one star to another and millions of years for light to travel between galaxies. Our story starts in the middle of the 1800s. In 1864, James Clerk Maxwell published some equations that hooked together electrical and magnetic phenomena. The solution to these equations predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. It was always known that if you have a changing magnetic field, it creates an electric field. That is the principle of the generator that produces all our electricity. Then, if you have a changing electric field, it creates a magnetic field. That is the principle of the electromagnet. So if you have an electrical or magnetic disturbance, you get this flip-flop of electric and magnetic fields driving each other out into space. And that's what electromagnetic radiation is. Depending on the wavelength, you can get long wave radio, medium wave radio, short wave, microwave, and then, then on into infrared and light and x-rays and so on. And all these el electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed, the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, C. Maxwell's equations predicted that the speed of light, C, is constant. Nothing very weird about that, except that unlike waves on a pond, which are carried by water, and sound, which is a pressure wave in air, there didn't seem to be any medium for the wave to travel in. There was definitely a wave, but what was it that was waving? So scientists invented a substance called the ether to carry electromagnetic magnetic radiation like air carries sound. And once they thought about it, suddenly it looked like Galilean relativity was wrong after all. Because if light always travels through the ether at the same speed, then all you have to do is measure the speed of light in a few directions, and with a little arithmetic you can work out what your speed is relative to the ether. And then we would have a an absolute velocity relative to something absolutely fixed, that is the fixed ether. In 1887, two gentlemen called Michelson and Morley conducted a very careful and very sensitive experiment to measure the speed of the Earth relative to the ether. And what was the result? It has been called the most famous failed experiment ever because they found absolutely nothing. No matter what direction they tried, no matter how carefully they made their measurements, the speed of light never changed by even the teeniest little bit. This was one of the two small, almost insignificant details that were still outstanding in, in physics at the end of the 1800s constancy of the speed of light. So in 1905 let's we enter with Einstein. Einstein was not the only contributor to relativity. There were others like Lorenz, Poincaré and Minovsky and others who pointed the way. Einstein was not a professional scientist. He was a patent examiner in Zurich, Switzerland, so he was an amateur like you. So what he said was, there are two facts that seem to be universally true. The first fact is that the speed of light seems to be always constant, no matter how you are moving. That was from the Michelson-Morley experiment. And because of that, the speed of light does not violate relativity. Whatever your speed, and no matter what direction you look, the speed of light is constant. And so you can't use the speed of light to find out your absolute velocity. So then he said, assuming both of these facts are true, what does the universe have to look like? So let's follow him and see where these two laws take us. 
Let's say we have two guys, Steady Steve, who's sitting on a rock on the Earth, and Fast Freddy, who's in a spaceship, passing Steve at 90% of the speed of light. As Freddy passes Steve, he sets off a flash of light. The distances involved in the speed of light are huge if you work in seconds, but a second is really quite a long time. Instead, let's work in microseconds. A microsecond is about how long it takes for your computer's processor to execute a thousand instructions, so it's quite a long time in computer terms. Now, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, and in one microsecond, which is 10 to the minus 6 seconds, light travels 300 meters, which is a nice, manageable num number. Both Steady Steve and Flash Freddy have clocks with a one microsecond tick rate. and They've made sure that they are both closely synchronized and run at the same speed. So let's see what happens after a microsecond. After one microsecond clock tick, Steve sees the light that Fe Freddy set off has traveled 300 meters. And he also sees, after the tick, that Freddy himself, who's traveling at 90% of the speed of light, has traveled 0.9 times 300, which is 270 meters. No problem at all with that. Steve sees that Fred has gone 270 meters in one microsecond, and the light flash has gone 300 meters, as expected, and everything makes sense. So the light flash is 30 meters in front of Fast Freddy. But what does Freddy see? The speed of light is constant, so he simply sees the flash of light 300 meters ahead. He doesn't even know that he's moving because he's looking straight ahead and not watching Steve. And if he was watching Steve, he'd just think that Steve was moving back at point 9C. So if relativity is true, then Steve sees a distance of 30 meters when Fred sees a distance of 300 meters. That's a big difference. So how can Freddy possibly think that the light flash is a full 300 meters ahead? What is Freddy smoking that he can be so wrong about a simple thing like a measurement of distance? What is Freddy smoking? He's obviously having some kind of hallucination because he can't tell the difference between 30 meters and 300 meters. So let's have a look at the kind of hallucinations that Freddy is having. What would have to be happening for Freddy to see the light flash 300 meters ahead instead of 30 meters after one microsecond? Either Freddy's ruler has shrunk so that 30 meters look to him like 300 meters. Possible. Weird, but possible. Or Freddy's clock has gone haywire, so that what Freddy thinks is one microsecond is really a much longer time, so that when Freddy thinks that a microsecond has passed, a lot more time has passed so that the 30 meters between him and the light flash has become much longer. Also a little bit weird, but possible. So what is the answer? The answer is both. Freddy's ruler has shrunk, and Freddy's clock is running slow. It's the combination of these that makes Freddy see the light flash 300 meters ahead when Steve sees it as 300 meters ahead. There is no other answer. Either the assumptions about relativity are wrong, or Freddy is seeing things in a quite different way from the way Steve sees them. In actual fact, if Steve looks at Freddy's clock, by the time Steve sees what Freddy sees as a microsecond, uh, for Freddy, 4.4 microseconds have passed. So the gap between Freddy and the light flash for Steve is not 30 meters, but 4.4 times 30 meters, which is 100, about 132 meters. 
and Freddy's ruler is shortened so that what looks to Steve like 132 meters looks like it's 2.3 times as long to Freddy and that works out exactly to the 300 meters. Once you have the concepts, working out what the actual time and length differences are is just a matter of some simple math, math that is well within your capabilities. No fancy calculus or other advanced stuff. The secret is just to write down expressions for what is happening with a very clear idea of whose length and whose time we are dealing with. You can find um, derivations of the equations on the, on the web. There's plenty of places where you can find them. But to give you an idea of the kind of thinking that goes into the derivations, uh, let's imagine that Steady Steve and Fast Freddy each have a special kind of clock. Each clock consists of a pair of mirrors set a, dis a set distance apart. A flash of light starts down the clock from the top, reaching the bottom a time later at T. Then the light bounces back up to the top mirror. The distance between the mirrors is CT, or the speed of light times the t time it takes to travel from the t mirror to mirror. The clocks are started and are identical, and then um, Freddy comes past at speed. Now Freddy takes his clock and travels past Steve at velocity V. Steve sees the light pulses from the clock not as going up and down, but doing a zigzag pattern. Steve sees the light going up at an angle as Freddy moves past him at velocity v. The speed of light remains the same as always, it has to, from relativity, but it takes a different time to bounce between the mirrors, because the path is longer. We call that time t dash, and then the distance the light travels is ct dash, and Freddy moves past the distance VT dash in one light bounce. So we have a right angle triangle, that blue triangle. One side of length VT and the hypotenuse, the long side, has a length CT. What's the length of the vertical side? It is square root of CT squared minus VT squared by simple old Pythagoras from 3000 years ago. So that's what Steve sees. What does Freddy see? Freddy sees what he always sees. The distance the light travels is CT, and that vertical length is the same for both Steve and for Freddy. So CT must be equal to the square root of CT squared minus VT squared. If we solve for T, we get T dash equals T over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So here we can see one of Freddy's hallucinations. His measurement of time is out of whack. His microsecond is longer than Steve's microsecond. That certainly helps explain how he can see the light move 300 meters ahead of him when Steve sees it only move 30 meters ahead of him. But you might say, hang on, what a stupid way to measure a, fri a microsecond. If Freddy used a different clock, wouldn't his clock tick be right? And the answer is that every clock is slow. How do we know? Well, if there was another clock that wasn't slow, Freddy could measure its clock tick against a special clock until he was moving, and that's against relativity. So what that means is that all Freddy's clocks are slow. So is his pulse, his breathing, the rate at which his hair grows, and the rate at which he grows old. If everything is slowed down, that's what we mean by time slowing down. By looking very carefully at how things work and using thought experiments like we just did and being very careful to use the right times and the right distances, you can derive these equations. And as I say, if you're interested, you can find the derivations on the web. These are called the equations of the Lorentz transformation after a Mr. Lorenz who originally came up with them as a fiddle to fix Maxwell's equations, but he didn't know why.
Note that in the equation for t dash, the term vx over c squared occurs in the numerator, which mixes up time and distance in a completely new way. Quite apart from the weird behavior and length and time, the, 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 the Lorenz transformation equations show us an interconnectedness of space and time. Prior to relativity, space and time were considered completely different quantities. Now, space and time are shown to be intertwined, and to understand the universe, we have to talk in terms of space-time. That factor, 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, appears all in the all over in the relativistic equations. It's always greater than 1, but when v is small, it's very close to 1. For instance, let's say v is as big as 0.1 c, or 30,000 kilometers per second, more than a thousand times faster than any spacecraft we have ever built. That factor then works out to only 1.005, still pretty close to 1. But when v is close to c, the factor becomes huge, until when v equals c, the factor is infinite. If v is less is greater than c, then 1 minus v squared over c squared becomes negative and the square root is imaginary. That's one indication that nothing can go faster than light. So this is pretty weird stuff, isn't it? And it all flows from those two principles. If they're both true, then the Lorentz transformation is also true. Why don't we experience this? We don't experience this in our lives because our lives are lived at a very, very slow pace. As I say, our fastest space probes don't travel as fast as even one ten thousandth of the speed of light. But electronics works in fractions of a nanosecond these days. In a nanosecond, light travels only 30 centimeters, about a foot. Is it a coincidence that as electronics get faster, the devices get smaller? If any of you are so inclined, you can try and use the Lorentz transformations to derive the results of the Freddy and Steve experiment. The math is easy, but the thinking is not. You have to be very clear what it is that you're measuring and whose time and distance you're using. Has any of this been tested? Yes, there have been many examples of time dilation in particular. And there are even practical effects where speeds are quite high and time accuracy is important. For instance, the GPS navigation system. You know that that depends on accurate timing signals from orbiting satellites. These satellites travel at about 4 kilometers per second. And over the day, if the time dilation were not corrected for, it would result in errors. Actually, the time dilation is swamped by a special re relativity effect of time speed up when you're at a high altitude in a gravitational field. But both effects have to be taken into account, or there would be errors amounting to about 10 kilometers per day. In nuclear physics, the effects of time and length changes have to be taken into account routinely because of the high speeds of the particles in an accelerator. So, as the world moves faster and our time intervals of interest shrink, relativity is going to become more important to us. It is impossible to, this, to go to the speed of light. There are various ways you can prove it, uh, but intuitively you can see that if, if the, that factor 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared becomes imaginary, uh, going faster than light is just not really an option. So, if nothing can go faster than light, what happens if we keep pushing something? At low speed, uh, if you know Newton's laws, uh, a force produces a constant acceleration. But clearly, once you get near the speed of light, the same force can't produce the same acceleration because you can't accelerate to the speed of light because the speed is capped at something less than c.
So we, if you apply a constant force to a fixed mass, you get a fixed acceleration. But when you get close to the speed of light, it doesn't accelerate so much. So what do we mean when something doesn't accelerate much when you apply a force? What we mean by that is that the what we see that as being is that the object has a lot of inertia, which is another way of saying it has a lot of mass. So as a body gets close to the speed of light, it behaves as if it has increased in mass. That is, it has got heavier. That's another weirdness of relativity. What do we mean by mass increases? Do we mean that it gets mysteriously more protons, neutrons, electrons, etc. than it had before? No, what we mean is that all those atomic particles get heavier. In the huge Hadron Collider at CERN, where they recently discovered the Higgs boson, they use magnets to keep the particles they're accelerating moving in a circle. Those particles are moving very close to the speed of light, so they weigh 2,000 times what they would do if they were not moving. The magnets also have to be 2,000 times stronger than they would be if relativity wasn't true. Some simple thought experiments using the laws of conservation of momentum and energy can tell us how mass has to increase close to the speed of light. So what is the formula for the mass increase? It increases by that familiar square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared factor. And that pretty well looks the way you would expect it to. It sort of gives kind of the right answers, doesn't it? As you get approach the speed of light, the mass approaches infinity and therefore the acceleration approaches zero. Uh, m0 of course is the rest mass, the mass when it's when before the body is moving. So that expression m equals m0 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared can also be written as m equals m0 times in brackets 1 minus v squared over c squared to the power of minus a half. And that can be expanded in a, in a Taylor, Taylor expansion as m equals m0 plus m0 v squared over 2c squared plus lots of other little terms that are insignificant when v is much less than c. Now let's multiply through by c squared and we start to see something familiar. Does anybody recognize that term m0 v squared over 2? Do you recognize that from your early uh, university physics or even high school physics? That's the ordinary expression for kinetic energy. The, that's the energy due to motion. E, so mc squared must be a total energy and it's made up of two parts. mv squared over 2 which we know is the energy due to motion and then there is a new part which we never knew was there before and which is there whether the body is moving or not and that is m0 c squared does that look familiar for an object at rest energy e equals m0 c squared or as it is usually written e equals mc squared and you may well have seen that equation. Very famous uh, result of the th special theory of relativity and was uh, is closely associated with nuclear physics. So E equals mc squared. That's a f this famous equation that gives us the amount of energy released if mass is converted to energy. 
So if you can cause mass to vanish, the energy given off is calculated as m squared. This has been ver verified very accurately by measuring the energy given off when matter and ant antimatter annihilate each other and in many other experiments. And of course, in atomic fission or fusion, the products weigh slightly less than the starting particles did. And that's the origin of the enormous energy output from atomic bombs and nuclear reactors. This is not a recipe for making nucle a nuclear bomb. Einstein never told anybody how they could make a nuclear bomb. It simply tells us how much energy we will get from annihilating matter. And a small amount of annihilated matter releases a lot of energy. In the Hiroshima explosion, the matter that was destroyed weighed about as much as a quarter of a dime and it produced a prodigious amount of energy. It looks like a lot of energy in our terms, but that's just because we are small, puny, weak creatures stuck on a rock, an insignificant rock out in space. To give you an idea, the sun needs to annihilate about 10 million tons of matter per second to produce the energy that it gives off. So it's all a matter of scale. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all there is to what is known as special relativity. Everything is there. There are some other ramifications and some elegant mathematics that allow you to play with space-time, but all the important stuff we've already talked about. I want you to note the process. Some mathematical physics by Maxwell predicted a constant light speed. Michelson and Morley discovered that not only is C constant, it's constant however you may be moving, which was an experiment. That suggested to Einstein that, that Galilean transformations still worked as a principle of nature and you could not distinguish between steady state moving and being stationary. This is not pulled out of the air, it's an hypothesis based on experiment. That principle of relativity uh, is all that is required to derive all the weird findings of relativity from the dilation of time to the energy in an atom bomb. As far as we can tell, the predictions made by the theory are absolutely dead accurate. Full circle of experimentation, theory, experimentation. That is the way that science is supposed to work, and it does when it works properly. Thank you very much for staying with me to the end. I hope you found this interesting and enlightening.